Welcome to the Women in Public Policy Program Seminar Series Podcast at the Harvard Kennedy School. I'm Hannah Riley Bowles. Um, I'm uh, the research director, is my role here in hosting this seminar at the Women in Public Policy Program. Uh, where we are committed to closing gender gaps in the areas of economic opportunity, political participation, health, and education. Um, and uh, while I'm here at the front of the room, I want you to imagine a much larger community, and because I will also um, welcome our podcast community, which has downloaded um, our seminars over 11,000 times. And so it is really a treat to have a kind of rippling effect beyond the scope of this room. Um, keeping in mind that we do have this larger community of listeners, we ask that um, uh, as we go along um, that uh, questions, when you ask them, are really questions, <laughs> and um, they're, you know, they're clarifying, and we kind of stay on the topic of, uh, of the presentation, which, it, which enables not only the people in the room to um, follow on and engage, um, but also it, it'll, it'll help um, our, our uh, virtual community. So I have the honor today of presenting our speaker, uh, Kristen Bumiller, who is the George Daniel Olds Professor in Economics and Social Institutions, and also the Chair of the Political Science Department at Amherst College. So we have her up here um, from Western Mass, in our, in our sort of larger Massachusetts community. And um, uh, Kristen has a, a, a broad body of work, she's got two uh, books, one on in an abusive state and another on civil rights in society. Uh, today, and she also does this wonderful practice work where she actually serves on the executive committee of the Inside Out Prison Exchange Program that teaches political science courses um, within the Hampshire County um, House of Corrections, which is, I know something a number of faculty out there in Western Mass are involved in. It's a very meaningful program. So she is, she is very much in the spirit of WAP. Um, a, uh, a scholar, but also a scholar engaged with practice and, and, and meaningful work. And today she is going to be um, talking to us about protection from gender violence as a civil right. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. It's my pleasure to be here today. I want to start with a caveat. Always good to begin by lowering expectations. <laughs> and that, despite the very broad title, I'm going to focus today mainly on um, the Office of Civil Rights enforcement of Title IX, but a lot of what I have to say broadly applies to any situation in where you have public enforcement of a civil rights remedy for violence. Um, and um, I also um, want to say that even though I'm, I've been a social scientist throughout my career and done a lot of work on uh, discrimination policy and sexual violence, mostly domestic violence and rape in a criminal setting. Um, the pr presentation that I'm giving today, the social science isn't up front and center, it's really behind the scenes, um, but it's there. Um, and um, if you have questions about what I'm saying or the empirical basis behind it, um, please uh, ask them. So um, my presentation, my slides are just, uh, uh, an extra visual rather than the encapsulation of the talk. So um, there's a lot of Know Your Rights movements, and one of the most prominent is the Know Your Title IX movement, and it aspires to change civil rights consciousness so that the ideal of equal opportunity is translated into a civil protection against violations of bodily integrity through violent acts. Um, and, but we all know when we ask the law, the individual to come before it, um, they stand before it um, quite precariously, waiting and hoping it will deliver its promises. Now, I would begin by suggesting that um, it makes a great deal of sense um, to have a, a sexual violence conceived of as a civil right, and it fits within our evolving meaning of rights in American society. So even before the civil rights movement, um, historical studies found that citizens claim the right to live in the everyday, free from the vagaries of others who pose their greater power illegally and with violence, and they expected the federal government to redress these acts in the face of the actions of their communities. 
And as the modern civil rights movement has evolved and developed, um, scholars and jurists have tried to articulate the ideal of civil rights and the essence of a civil rights consciousness as grounded in more than the equality between groups, but a grounded into the appeal to human dignity, to advance the principle of anti-humiliation, and to provide safeguards from citizens from shattering emotional and physical threats to their integrity. So these ideals explain and suggest why and for what reasons we would ask the state to protect against sexual violence as a civil right. Sexualized violence fundamentally is an act of disrespect against person and imposes lasting physical and emotional harm. However, that universal right in the American context of law and policy is very limited. Um, you probably are all familiar, um, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act prohibits sex discrimination, sexual harassment, for example, in employment context, but it has to be very directly linked to an adverse employment decision or severely impact the capacity of a woman to do her job. Um, and our most ambitious attempt to um, protect against gender animus um, the Civil Rights Remedy of the Women, Violence Against <coughs> Women Act was struck down in the Supreme Court case of Uni United States versus Morrison. So given these defeats of these earlier measures to establish protection against uh, sexual violence as a civil rights, um, the move taken in 2011 by the Office of Civil Rights um, is, a, is a, a risky move, quite obviously. The guidance letter placed object place obligations on education institutions and inform students of protections as a civil right. This ostensibly breaks new grounds to enforce a civil rights remedy in response to any and all forms of sexual misconduct. So you may be aware, because this has been con controversial, the OCR enforcement has stimulated both praise for its bold determination to address an epidemic of sexual violence on college campuses and criticism for its capacious exercise of administrative power. So the OC, OCR's issuing of informal guidelines, which arguably does extend upon enumerated doctrine of sex discrimination and has very exacting requirements for compliance, you could argue is a bold and dynamic approach to use federal administrative power to address an intractable social problem. This approach um, most evidently does circumvent formal rulemaking rule processes and ultimately will re rely upon validation in federal courts. In other words, the jury's still out. Yet this threat, but really important to my analysis, is that this strategy isn't new. In fact, this is the backbone of how federal government desegregated public schools and how Title IX was used to equalize opportunities for women in athletics. So while many of these guidelines are um, devoted to provisions making information uniformly available to students, the most controversial ones and the ones I'm not going to talk about are the ones that um, place colleges and universities in an investigative and adjudicative function um, vis a vis their students who make claims and are being claimed against. So, this has led to a raging debate um, about whether such kinds of claims should be adjudicated in disciplinary hearings or whether they're more appropriately handled, especially if it's a claim of race, um, in a criminal court. Now, I think this kind of dichotomy of the problem doesn't really get at the complex reality of the social policies governing, governing or guiding um, uh, policy enforcement. And so that's what I want to look at today. This is just there. So this is the preview of the argument I'm going to present. First, I'm going to talk about the consequences of displacing private action with public enforcement. Um, and then I'm going to look at the confluence between um, the Office of Civil Rights Directives and the managerial prerogatives within universities and how they are symbi symbiotic with each other. Um, thirdly, I'm going to look at the role of legal entrepreneurs in creating a compliance regime. Um, fourthly, I want to look at Title IX um, enforcement in regard to the larger kind of symbolic and political project 
of protecting women against sexual violence. And then finally, um, I want to look at how this all fits into the larger issue that I talked about in my book, The In the Abusive State, of civil rights enforcement expanding <coughs> a crime control agenda. So that's the big picture of where I want to go. So recent efforts of the Office of Civil Rights, I think, present a new and varied chapter in the effectiveness of public enforcement of civil rights statute. So the civil rights revolution, as it has evolved since the 1960s, has always depended on what we call the hybridity of public and private action. So we're, in regards to Title VII, public enforcement has been critical, but it's always played a role alongside substantial private actors as enforcers. Um, and what we <coughs> call this is uh, individuals acting as private attorneys general. They seek enforcement not only in their own behalf, but also in the public interest. In this way, individuals, individuals who file claims, um, play a role in determining the course of doctrinal expansion, and they set the stage for future litigants. While private action is vital to the expansion of legal protections, victims of discrimination are precarious rights bearers. So the procedures that allow for private action under Title VII, and all the same procedures also apply under Title IX, um, Put, have put on um, many restrictions, enabled and then reduced the restriction through a series of Supreme Court and legislative actions. And so despite the public perception that we live in a litigious society, um, socio-legal scholars have well document, documented that those who experience discrimination face enormous financial, psychological, and logistical obstacles to asserting rights in courts. So like other civil rights litigants, students who experience sexual harassment or violence have very limited capacity for private action. They can either file an anti-discrimination claim in federal courts or make a complaint for effective protection directly to the Office of Civil Rights. Both forms of action, um, although statistics aren't readily available, likely occur in small numbers and it's very difficult um, to, cre to um, substantiate an uh, individual action because there's a very high standard called deliberate indifference to, in order for a, a claim to be made against the school. So the ORC also has been criticized um, for its overemphasis on public enforcement and little um, attention to the individual claims that are made for effective protection. Um, a recent article in the Yale Law, Ju Law Journal drawing on vo voices of those who filed complaint concludes, the status quo calls upon survivors to sacrifice themselves while the OCR seeks meaningful systematic change. Um, this kind of um, burdensome of long waits and not getting any relief um, has been particularly bad for um, litigants who are seeking financial compensation or want that they need to resume or complete their education. So this is my point in the first part of my argument with the diminishing prospects for private action, we actually run the risk of letting the goals of public agency supersede the interests of potential litigants. This over-reliance on public agency enforcement potentially weakens the participatory and democratic effects of private action. When individuals initiate complaints, the cumulative effect of their action signal violations, articulate harms, and stimulate um, policy inter in innovation. So then I also want to argue that there's more at stake here than the proper balance of resources devoted to structural reform versus victim remedies. The current objectives of the OCR, unlike previous efforts to concretize the meaning of racial balance in school desegregation or design suitable measures for equal funding in school athletic programs is broadly directed to the goal of assuring students feel safe in school. Consequently, achieving a non-discriminatory environment rather than being linked directly to the equity of resources is defined by the willingness of institutions to adopt and strictly adhere to a set of procedures. 
outlined as best practices. In effect, anti-discrimination policy is now being implemented through command and control regulation. So the public announcement of this new enforcement regime emphasized its mission to take violence seriously and to promote transparency by releasing the names of colleges and universities under investigation. This regulatory environment strongly motivates institutions of higher education to elude public shaming and activate liability avoidance. These motivating factors are particularly impactful given the fit between compliance mechanisms and the managerial structures already in place in institutions of higher education. What looks like heavy-handed administrative governance is actually a hand fitting in a glove. Managerialism in corporation universities in particular are, are, are um, growing in all aspects of university lives. And we are probably all familiar with administrators and stressing the importance of fostering more administrative rationality, efficiency, quality control, and evidence-based programming. So a substantial body of literature shows that why managerial logics may produce voluntary commitments to diversity and sexual harassment preve prevention, these efforts might be very loosely connected to the actual promotion of equality within organizations. Diversity as we know it is largely instrumental to the public relations agenda and is driven by an argument of what's good for business or what's good for an uh, institution's reputation. <coughs> Legal compliance is often merely symbolic, especially when managers divert the impact of anti-discrimination law by enacting forms of formal compliance that in practice isolate the organization from litigation and deflect substantive change. So despite the absolute re remarkable specificity of um, OCR guidelines that was provided for universities and colleges in their, in their, um, in their guidance letter, um, many institutions of higher education have raced to what are called compliance specialists. They're usually lawyers and risk managers. They claim to offer expertise on the correct interpretation of guidance letters and the necessary steps to avoid sanctions. Much of their focus is advising administrators on how to reconcile the adoption of OCR recommended procedures with the current overlapping federal regulations and their pre-existing disciplinary apparatus. Their advisory materials describe compliance as part of a culture shift that requires all employees to gain cognizance of, of their responsibility to reduce risk and to assure student safety. The challenges of compliance, according to the consultants, what they are telling the administrators, um, stem from the complacency of university, per university personnel who assume that their professional status exempts them from regulatory enforcement, people like us, um, who don't see ourselves as usually the object of federal regulation. By posing the university as a regulatory resistant environment, Title IX compliance specialists provide the broadest interpretation possible of best practices, justified by an all-encompassing logic of minimizing risk. But they also strongly counsel their university clients to use this opportunity to standardize workplace regulations and to increase monitoring of all kinds of employee behavior. So it's notable that the most influential consultants prior to the emergence of Title IX scandals in 2012, made similar recommendations in regard to minimizing liability in the face of um, shootings on campus. In their prior work, it's actually the same people who were working with campuses um, to reduce liability for um, those kinds of incidents. In their prior work, the training of administrators emphasized not only that campuses were an emergency response zone, but also that promoting campus safety often required trade-offs with competing student rights, such as privacy protections for students with disabilities whose mental instabilities pose potential threats. The campus response to Title IX enforcement, once placed within the paradigm, is framed as presenti presenting similar trade-offs between student and faculty rights and campus safety issues. So now what is concerning what 
Title IX compliance becomes widely disseminated as a practice of safety regulation is that competing rights claims are now measured or dismissed as contrary to the promotion of safe campuses. The regulatory framework now in place inevitably justifies policies that are divergent from the culture of academic life, such as mandatory reporting, investigatory and fact-finding finding methods of <coughs> resolution, displace, displacing community standards uh, with expert judgments, and proceeding without victim cooperation. The regulatory structure fundamentally transforms the rationale behind OCR enforcement, which supposedly is equal right to education, and substitutes it with the broader goal of campus safety. This strategy constitutes more than routine application of bureaucratic managerial logic, but rather uses OCR directives instrumentally to transform organizational culture. So reduced flexibility in how anti-discrimination goals are met, combined with internal incentives to interpret compliance broadly to reduce risk, creates a climate in which regulations stand in for rights. And this is part of my major argument, that regulations stand in for rights, compete, and they compete with fundamental protections that define relationships in college and university settings. Title IX <coughs> implementation has not only brought concerns about the fairness of hearings that I think you probably have all heard about, but it also has come between institutional responsibilities to protect the privacy and autonomy of all students. Commentators who have identified the threats of Title IX, including the AAUP, um, have pointed to threats to due process rights, academic freedom, and employee contracts. A recent summary judgment of a Title IX case in the federal courts in our jurisdiction um, uh, points out that the lack of basic fairness provided by hearing procedures violates the implied contract between the student and the university. <coughs> so another profound consequence of the assumption of managerial logic is how it construes sexual violence as a gender issue to be managed. It becomes part of a larger assembly of managing gender within organizations in which formal equality is conceived as observance of gender-blind policies. The goal of such policies is to make sure that employee or student's gender identity doesn't interfere with the uniform applicability of personnel ma management procedures or disciplinary policies. A well-managed organization, therefore, protects equality by implementing appropriate gender-based exceptions, such as pregnancy leave, but always by assuring that there are no disturbances arising from women's incorporation in the community. For example, sexual harassment policies are fastly becoming fully incorporated to and indistinguishable <coughs> from the larger category of workplace disruption procedures. So incongruently, at the level of policy implementation and in disciplinary hearings, sexual violence itself has now become a gender neutral activity. By applying to both men and women, broad inter interpretations of the requirements of Title IX justify the consideration of array of new regulations for virtually all matters regarding sex, regardless of its gendered man manifestation. Such policies further the assumption that both genders are harassed, but also the assumption that all harmful harassment is sexualized. Universities have begun to adopt a wide range of policies justified by concerns about Title IX sa sanctions or diverse, more diffuse concerns about safe campuses, which beef up disciplinary consequences um, for faculty who engage in sex practices. And these are all familiar, such as the new advent of more regulations about consensual <coughs> relationships between professors and students, trigger warnings, um, uh, mandates to have more criminal background checks for faculty and students are some of the examples. So once framed both as a gen in gender neutral terms and abstracted from any theory about gender inequality, almost everything and anything re related to sex is viewed as a liability issue. 
So stepped up Office of Civil Rights Enforcement, legislative action, and rampant media attention has popularized a renewed interest on the national agenda to sexual violence. It has many similarities to the way anti-violence agenda emerged during second wave feminism, um, but the new movement has a slightly new focus, and that's about making institutions accountable. So recent calls to action have often made reference to a broken culture, a metaphor which is evocative of both the feminist critique of rape culture but it's also a term coined to describe corporate environments lacking in leadership and rife with unethical behavior. So this duality, a symbolic duality, is ever present as national leaders have brought discordant agendas to the common call to recognize an epidemic of sexual assault and place the blame on institutions of higher education. So in this highly polarized field of symbolic issues, the announcement of a rape epidemic has a expected effect. It divides all implied constituencies into two opposing camps, those who demand justice in the name of victims and those who condone the violence of rapists and engage in victim blaming. Like earlier feminist campaigns, the, a more complex understanding of the causes of sexual violence is muta muted by calls to protect an ide idealized <coughs> victim, in this instance women in college whose innocence is often applied by status and sometimes by race. Why other forms of violence imposed on unsympathetic victims are in situations without gender-based motivations that are non-sexual in nature or simply situations of violence pervasive in everyday life receive little <laughs> attention. Unfortunately, calling an end to sexual violence on campuses creates coalitions of the willing who see advocating for more punishment as a popular solution. This is an opportunity for legislators to show yet another way that they are tough on crime. So the new OCR guidelines um, is one form of what I would call administrative actions that take a derivative civil rights authority and use and implement it through federal criminal right policy. And actually I've looked at the Prison Rape Elimination Act, which actually bears very close re resemblance on what's going on in colleges and universities, but there's also parallels to the Military Justice Improvement Act and the sub-authorized uh, piece of Trafficking Victims Act within um, the Violence Against Women Act. So um, this is just to say that it's part of larger phenomena. So the dramatic political language accompanying the announcement of crisis sets the stage for the regulation of resources and the building of consensus for the adoption of new legislation. And that's what I want to talk about, the new legislation in Congress, um, which is where most of the activity is at the moment. So the political scientist Murray Edelman, in his classic scholarship on symbolic politics, demonstrates <laughs> that when leaders point to recurring crises, they construct a reality that is disconnected from facts serves to polarize audiences, evokes en enemies, simplifies the problems, and overestimates the capacity of government to solve it, especially the last one. These symbolic cues are especially potent when refer referencing sex and violence, symbols that evoke underlying anxieties and uncertainties endemic to modern life and rally our sympathy for victims. Like other single issue political crises, that political leaders capitalize upon, such as the war against drugs or the threat of child abduction, symbolic politics create opportunities for leaders to claim responsibility for success in addressing a social problem. Behind the spectacle of politics, political leaders maintain and consolidate power through administrative and legislative action that often reinforces the status quo. So the symbolic discourse that focuses on this crisis uses very popularizing <coughs> rhetoric. Sexual misconduct is now marketed as not just a woman's issue but as a men's issue. Men are acknowledged as possible victims of rape and men are asked to assume their role as protectors of women. The face of this campaign is It's On Us, which encouraged college students to take a pledge, you sign up on the internet, a personal commitment to help keep women and men safe from sexual assault. In a short info commercial, array of attractive young men and women of various races and ethnicities 
recite the anti-rape mantra, sex without consent isn't sex, it is rape. And then the website employs, employs a sophisticated and creative logo design and branding techniques offered by the advertising agency Mechanism, most often util utilized by businesses to establish an edge over competition. Um, but here it's repackaged for an anti-rape campaign. <coughs> Unfortunately, the focus on rape on college campus is another manifestation of campaigns designed to further the adoption of victim-centered crime control measures. And there's a large literature about a lot of the failures of these victim-centered approaches that I'd be happy to talk about. But these movements have literally arisen in the name of victims, and they include Megan and Jessica Laws and Amber Alerts. In this instance, survivors stand up for themselves by organizing through social media and forming victims' rights organization. Um, know Your Title IX is one of them. Um, but at the same time, they stand behind politicians, university administrators, and federal regulators in reference to them as the designated objects of reform. On behalf of what is commonly referred to as the activists, spokesmen feel rage, admire their bravery, and note their courage. So in conjunction with victim-centered politics, the symbolic language justifies a shift of resources to crime control. As Jonathan Simon argues in his book, Governing Through Crime, this language evokes a vision of distinctive legislative rationality <laughs> that imagines the needs of citizens framed through the problem of crime. These rhetorical motifs, as applied to campus rape, typify the predatory behavior of criminals, usually class, cast as male members of fraternities and athletic teams. Proponents of new measures construct, construct perpetrators is running rampant and victims in need of vindication through more severe punishment. This posturing was seen in most recent congressional hearings on campus safety in which the threat of the serial rapist was repeatedly evoked um, and often evoked through the citing of one unreliable study that says serial rapists threaten campus. More than 90% of campus rapes are committed by a rel relatively small percentage of college men possibly as few as 4% who rape repeatedly, averaging six victims each. And this, this um, mantra, this evidence is repeated over and over in the co congressional hearings and it comes from one very old, unreliable study. The one of the most consequential effects of tropes of crime control is that it casts all sexual misconduct from a sexist comment to forcible rape as necessitating and only corrected by punitive action. So decades of social science research has demonstrated that victims don't benefit from victim-oriented criminal justice legislation. These studies show that criminal justice response to both rape and domestic violence victims often is ineffective and counterproductive and at worst criminalizes women and robs them of their autonomy. And that's the subject of my book, In Abusive State. The crime control aspects have been taken up most recently in Congress Can I by- Can quick clarification? Yeah. You, you said it criminalizes women or it victimizes women? It criminalizes women. Oh. So women may um, be subjected to arrest themselves when they make a domestic violence claim or oh. um, that may affect um, their um, a relationship with their children and so they may um, be, be kind of caught up in the criminal justice, justice system in that way. <laughs> so the, um, the most recent um, efforts are CASA, Campus Accountability and Safety Act. This is just another example of the, what I call the bad actor theory. So it's a bill that has bipartisan support and it's um, expected to pass in this coming lame dex um, se session. What it requires is that all universities establish memorandums of understanding with all local criminal justice agencies or they'll each be subjected to fines. Um, the bill also requires every single college and university have a confidential advisor on staff who it, the, the advocates saw as someone who would protect students from coercion to report or excessive surveillance or protect their privacy interests, except this advisor must also fulfill the role of a criminal justice advocate by investigating and reporting to law enforcement. So the congressional call to strengthen law enforcement's role in collaboration with institutions of higher education furthers public confusion about the role of adjudication on campus via the criminal prosecution of sexual assault crimes. 
So it makes to say, if we, if we got the criminal justice officials in there quicker, then the colleges could do a better job of getting these cases into the criminal courts, and it satisfies these people who are worried about these cases um, being adjudicated on campuses rather than in the courts. But social scientists know that um, uh, all sexual assault cases have very high attrition rates at all levels from reporting, charging, prosecution, and conviction. Only a very small percentage of, of sexual assault cases um, go to trial. Uh, even in sexual assault cases um, where there's a clear legal statute in the ju jurisdiction that allows for acquaintance rape, and if there's good evidence, uh, the social science evidence shows that the most likely outcome would be a plea bargaining of less than six months. So clearly complaints considered in campus hearings, except for the few that may be prosecuted <coughs> in a companion criminal case, would hardly ever lead to a conviction or sentencing in criminal court. So MOUs with local enforcement or more immediate police investigations will do nothing to change the phenomena that has persisted after 30 years of rape law reform. Consequently, campus adjudications that involve complaints of sexual assault, as well as less severe forms of sexual conduct that warrant a Title IX investigation, are the, for the most part, are not or will never be viable criminal matters. And if the complaint was instigated by a single incident and its impact was not severe, it would not rise to the standards necessary to even demonstrate sexual harassment in a civil complaint. So much of the business of Title IX reporting, investigation, and adjudication arises from situations that raise no issue of public safety and furthermore would never result in a criminal court conviction or launch a successful civil action. So to get to the final um, bits, and this is the hearings, and you can see the victims' advocates, and this is the, the um, It's On Us rallies. Um, and the advocates are the young woman behind, and this is officers in a, um, and universities uh, and officers together in an MOU agreement. So this doesn't mean, however, what gets reported to Title IX officers is not sex discrimination and that these instances of discrimination might potentially appear with and negatively impact students' opportunities to education. But this is why it makes sense for Title IX enforcement to primarily focus on victim support. It's important to design policies that recognize sexual harassment on college campus occurs within a broad spectrum of severity. In some cases, a victim may want a degree of punishment imposed on the accused, and in a few situations, an immediate police response to protect public safety might be necessary. But victims' desires and needs vary greatly. Often the most important priority is to regain control and to be treated with respect, but also people who experience discrimination in all forms have the right to demand compassionate counseling, financial compensation, and effective plans for remedial action. So a lot of things happen but it doesn't happen, and they happen in the name of victims, but it doesn't necessarily help them. So when individuals' capacity to claim their rights is diminished through regulatory authority, it allows organizations to prioritize their own interests, and in, in effect, to act as gatekeepers who retain their power to minimize the trouble caused by the person seeking justice. In a political context in which administrators, <laughs> administrators are under attack for their betrayal of victims, adherence to guideline falsely positions them in their new role as protectors. This role masks how enforcement mechani mechanisms actually augment <coughs> institutional power and potentially give college and university administrators broad leeway to claim they are acting in the best interest of campus safety. The greatest disappointment with Title IX enforcement is that it does, has very limited potential to stimulate the growth Go, the growth of civil rights consciousness or promote equal opportunity more generally. In fact, by encouraging only talk of sexual misconduct as a crime, it precludes thought-provoking analysis of how shifting power relations between genders within the current generations of students might contribute to this and other forms of abuse of power and disrespect. The essential problem with current Title IX enforcement strategy is it never established its force as a civil rights measure. 
and substituted crime control as its fundamental purpose. As made clear in the guidance letters, um, so this is in the words of the Office of Civil Rights, the measure of taking sexual violence seriously is demonstrated by the punishment of the accused. The role of law is expressly punitive. So as long as, my, as long as this is the goal, we'll have a conflation between civil adjudication and the criminal justice process. Both process are link, linked to the assertion of state power and institutional power, um, and they're in the service of their own agenda. And I think what the real harm here is that these power dynamics soundly ignore um, what's really going on, and it creates a false perception that victims possess too much power, and yet generating another excuse to revive all too familiar tropes of victim blaming. I have a number of questions. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really interested in, um, this is a, a very powerful, thought-provoking stuff. This, this has been an issue, obviously, on our campus as well as um, many others. Could you talk about this broader literature that you referenced about um, victim-centered criminal justice and its um, kind of implications for yeah. actually undermining the, the I, I gather it's undermining the rights of the victims or, or I don't know what exactly, could you just yeah, talk about yeah. that? Yeah, well so the, there's two bodies of literature. One I started to talk about a little bit. Um, and it's mostly in the realm of domestic violence victims. Um, and, um, uh, you know, depending on your own social situation and your relationship with the police, um, you may be very reluctant to get law enforcement involved in your situation. Um, with the growth of more mandatory laws, it means once the police is called, um, they often are required to take some action. Um, and what happens is that mandatory arrest has turned into dual arrest. And so all the other party has to do is say, she hit me too, and she gets taken off the court also. Um, but in a more broader way, um, uh, there are many issues about cooperation between um, prosecutors and um, both rape victims and victims who experience um, domestic violence. And if they can't, um, achieve cooperation, sometimes women will be threatened with their children being taken away, or they'll be threatened as, uh, as um, you know, being subject to some other kinds of criminal action. Um, often these are situations where one or both parties may be engaged in other legal act illegal activities, and so getting the family involved with the criminal justice process in, in these situations um, could have a lot of impl implications for um, both both parties. And so there, there is um, a broad literature on um, what I would call the collateral consequences of domestic violence enforcement. There's another set of literature about the victim center <coughs> laws. Um, and um, we can just take the ones about Amber Alerts. Um, um, one of the major arguments is that there's a lot of resources that are being put into having something like Amber Alert systems put in place, and so it's a diversion of resources that might be put in better places. Most Amber Alerts, which are, um, you know, they evoke the image of a random child abduction, are usually, um, it's a domestic ex dispute where um, one of the partners in a, a child custody situation has taken the child. And so the whole idea of the Amber Alert, um, when it get, actually gets practiced in reality, doesn't help much to um, help victims. Um, in a much larger sense, um, those of us who are worried about uh, mass incarceration and the, um, the kind of over-involvement of the criminal justice system in people's lives, um, these victim centers laws have often um, necessitated very punitive reactions in, in cases and, you know, a three strikes law or a version of a three, three strikes law. And so they're used 
this kind of activism is used to up the ante to make sure that criminal justice enforcement is more severe. I don't know if that answers the question. Yes. Um, and I'm Victoria Butson, I'm the executive director here. Um, in one of my other roles is I chair the Commission on the Status of Women and Girls for the state of Massachusetts. So when we're talking about how engagement with the criminal justice system can create all kinds of additional consequences for the family because once you've opened the door to any type of law enforcement scrutiny within a situation, there's all kinds of um, inquiry which can be administered from that point forward. And once you engage, of course, in the legal process and the state is prosecuting, whether that state is federal, whether that state is a province or a state here in the United States, um, certainly that means it's out of the victim's hand. But one of the things I wanted to ask about from your perspective, so we know that the state has an interest if someone goes into a bar and stabs another party. The state says they have an interest in prosecuting regardless of whether the victim wants to prosecute because we don't want people walking around and stabbing people. So as a collective community and entity, we believe that there's investment. And the argument which you're discussing creates a bright line between a situation that takes place on private property that's considered domestic versus private property that's considered public, where the public goes in and assumes a difference in state interest based on that boundary. So in the literature, though, certainly every victim doesn't seek to want prosecution for a bunch of reasons which are thoroughly valid within that person's life. When we talk about what is the interest of the state, what is the consequence as a society and a community for having that level of violence, whether it's um, reduction in GDP because loss of work, whether it's um, consequence for the next generation, whether it's repeat visits to the hospital and resources which are being taken there. So I wondered if you could speak to that. Yeah. So. Um, I, would, I wouldn't argue that the state doesn't have a compelling interest in many situations. Um, and there certainly may be um, situations, they may be in the majority of situations, where um, the state interest is in line with the, um, the woman's interest or the victim's interest. Um, and, um, and state prosecution um, is in the best interest. Um, and, um, but I think that you can't make a simple analogy between a domestic violence situation and a stabbing in a bar. Um, these are relationships that are often um, either marriage or partner relationships or long term. Um, women um, often uh, are protecting the interests of their children. Um, women may be better able to predict what kinds of actions may make them more vulnerable to more violence and to possibly even serious injury. Um, and so when you uh, replace the state's um, power to act with the victim's autonomy, I think it's always going to raise complex questions about whether um, the, st the state can, can, can effectively act, act in their um, capacity. Um, so, um, you know, it's not an absolute situation one or another, but I think um, the more that we can move, to, and I think um, new, uh, kind of a whole new generation of advocates have really emphasized victim autonomy. And I think it's because of the, of the consequences of how policies have affected women in the past. But, but I think one of the really, important pieces on that is the difference between mandatory prosecution and the difference between access to the criminal justice system. Um, and if it comes up in another question, I'd be interested in how you define victim-centric laws versus non-victim-centric laws. Mm -hmm. Did you want me to go on and then say yeah. yeah. So my question, I mean, I understand that you have to protect women's autonomy as they understand their situation and the consequence of involving um, uh, police forces in a situation of domestic violence uh, and that they might not be interested in, in, in continuing um, processes. But 
think the point is often women are in a situation where you know they, they can't uh, pursue a, co a complaint or because they are very vulnerable and so I think the, the, the perspective there would be to say well we should be able to protect the negative protect women against the negative consequences at the same time as we offer uh, support when they would naturally say well you know maybe I should be protecting my children however I mean we can't let the situation continue the situation of violence for instance continue as that can have um, negative effects on the same children so how I mean shouldn't we be discussing how can we protect women um, from those negative consequences instead of just saying well they have the autonomy of deciding whether they will prosecute or not, for instance, uh, when they are in a situation of vulnerability where, for instance, the partner might be saying, well, if you pursue this, I will damage you more, or I will take your children, or, um, I mean, how do we, how, how do we do that? So, yeah, well, I, um, I mean, I think that, I mean, and this goes to your question too, certainly having more comprehensive and realistic victim support does go part of the way, but I don't think it goes all of the way. Um, uh, some women distrust the criminal justice system for good reason, <laughs> in that um, you know, they, if, if you're a woman and, and the police come into your community and they um, have, there's a very high arrest rate, um, they, um, they don't want to solve their problems through police involvement. Um, and um, and they um, and they may have other strategies um, that would enable them um, to address the, the situation. Um, and I um, I think in situations where there is a lack of victim cooperation, um, they may be situations where um, the woman does decide to return to the abuser. And you might say, you know, abstractly. You know, we want to intervene, but um, people who study domestic violence say that sometimes it takes seven or eight times for a woman to make, take that step. Um, and um, and I, I think intervening in a way that takes away a woman's autonomy may actually deter her from making the progress to a more independent life. Um, but I, I also think um, that that you're describing the criminal justice system is much more benign than it is. Um, because um, uh, they can use their coercive authority to threaten women to take away their children. Um, they can use their authority um, to threaten them to appear in court. Um, they can um, uh, hold them up on other uh, criminal matters. Um, uh, especially if you come from a community in which drug trafficking is a major economic source of people's viability. Um, uh, so uh, if, if you're not totally clean, um, this kind of involvement can be um, a, a really negative for, for women. Um, and it is, I mean, you might have this situation, it really is the poor women, women the most vulnerable, the women from the most highly policed communities they're the ones who are in our domestic violence courts. So I'm not giving you the example of the unique case. I'm giving you an example of the usual women who um, are you know, subject to this kind of state authority. Yeah. Hi, I'm Miriam Zolman, alumna of Kennedy School. Uh, to what degree do you think the problematic perpetration research on this has affected the institutional and legislative response to the issue, not just the rhetoric around it. And do you think it's going to take, you know, research, uh, you know, taking into account the reality of sexual assault to fix that, or do you think that advocacy alone from more victim-centric advocates can kind of change the way we think about perpetration? Yeah, I mean that's a really good question, and I, I know a lot of scholars who work in the area of sexual assault. They've been working for decades trying to develop more reliable data. Um, and um, in this whole Title IX controversy, none of that seems to come into play. I mean, even with the, not directly your question, but I think it's a good example to illustrate it. 
Um, researchers have worked very hard on developing more reliable ways to get um, uh, uh, victim surveys and to um, come up with um, a way of measuring the percentage of people who have experienced sexual assault. Um, and none of that expertise was used, you know, when the you know Association of American U Universities devised this survey that was used in you know across a lot of colleges and universities, a very unreliable measure. Um, <laughs> and um, and so that's the data. That's the data that makes the news and that drives the policy. I mean, it's an enormous and frustrating frustrating issue for. Um, people who do research, and to go more directly to your question, the perpetrator research, I mean, this is one study by a hack psychologist, you know, who is based on um, these, like, sample, very small sample of people he treated or something like that. Um, it, it, was it is published in an academic journal. Um, it's about 20 years <coughs> old. <laughs> And um, and it, it gets cited and recited. Um, here, here yeah. Also. Oh, you're here, here yeah, too. But in here. all these policy communities, when there's um, a much better, you know, I mean, uh, to me, you know, the range of kinds of sexual misconduct that exists is very large. But this study, it just perpetrates the idea of the serial rapist. Um, and um, so I. Um, I mean, I think that social science researchers are in the midst of trying to get a grip <laughs> and respond to um, that kind of information that seems to have such play. Well, well um, there's, there's legislation that's being formed now. A commission is likely to be formed. It's probably going to pass in Massachusetts during the informal session where they're going to look at and devise climate surveys based on AAUW, but it may be mandatory yeah. for every institution of higher ed to do it. So if the academic community <coughs> beyond who's already engaged with the AAUW feels that they have something that's different and of value, this would be an important time for people to connect into that process. Yeah. And this federal legislation will also mandate it to climate surveys. Yes. I don't want to take you too far off topic, but I was wondering if you could say something about um, crime prevention. And the reason I say that is because, for example, in the UK, we have we had a uh, fairly recent legislation on female genital mutilation, and there's been either I think one attempt or no prosecutions, and that's partly because of you know what you speak to, that people don't want to, um, you know, often their families are involved in facilitating. I mean, supposedly, well, let me just do this um, female genital, <coughs> genital mutilation. I think it's an example of what I'm talking about. It turns something that maybe the women who experience don't understand it as a crime into something that resonates in a crime control agenda. And it's also targeted against a certain group of immigrant or women. So. Um, there's a way in which um, it's very much, uh, very much similar, um, but I also Title IX is supposed to devote a lot of resources to prevention, and to some extent it does. Um, you know, the most popular prevention strategy in this case is the um, bystander programs, um, which train friends to intervene when they see a potential situation. Um, again, bystander pro programs. <laughs> 
I just uh, kind of anonymously <coughs> reviewed some uh, journal articles about them. The evidence saying that they're really effective, you know, isn't there. But the move to say everybody has to have a bystander program in place is very fast. Um, and so um, I don't think we've thought broadly enough about prevention. And I'm the kind of person who, um, in my most theoretical mode, th it, it goes to how do we reimagine culture and society in such a way that we, we get beyond um, this understanding of women as objects and subjects of violence. And so I do think that part of prevention is a deep cultural change, you know, very much <coughs> related to the, our, our concept of women's status in society. And I always also link it back to the question of equality. I think, I, I don't know how clear it was in my talk, but one of the things that upsets me most about Title IX is that the link back to the discourse of equality, and as that is the ultimate goal, seems to get lost. Um, and I think if we're gonna think of both prevention and um, rethinking the culture of sexual violence, that we have to really much um, uh, integrate into a strategy of how you produce equality. Yeah. So I'm really interested in, in your, your lens that you use of institutional risk, right? And you say that that's kind of <coughs> moved up to be so important. And what I'm interested in is how do you tip the balance? And I'm thinking of, you know, the Globe and the Spotlight teams and a couple of things that they've done and Fox News and, you know, suddenly things that for years that we all knew was happening have become visible and objectionable. I mean, you know, it's, it's like, um, it's not that nobody knew that this was going on. It's just that somehow we kind of swept it under the table. So this question of how do you change the balance on institutional risk so that it's riskier not to take action, right? Or to, you know, just protect the institution at the cost of individuals. Yeah, so, um, I think to answer that question, I go to organizational theory. Um, and um, I think about um, if an institution gets either pressure from the inside or the outside, what kind of strategies are they going to use to minimize their liability? Um, and obviously, there are enormous number of ways an institution could do it. The prime one would be to actually try to solve the problem, right? Um, and to change, think about how they could um, really change um, institutional cul culture. Um, I I'll give you an example that I think exp explains my, my attitude. I think I feel, I've always taught classes about race and sexual violence. I feel like in today's campus climate, I feel less comfortable doing it um, because I feel like the complex messages that I would talk about, the discussions that I would have in the room, don't fall in line specifically with what the Title IX officer wants students to hear about race. Um, so this is not creating a climate in which um, we can really create more open discussion to talk about sexual violence. Um, and I believe putting the issue out in the open, that's why in some ways I welcome um, the, the media attention to the issue is part of the solution. But um, to be quite crude about it, um, what's happening is all the, all the power is being given to um, risk managers or attorneys. And so, for example, if um, say it's an ambiguous situation, it's a disciplinary action, a re kind of a respect to persons question between students, but one student's female and one student's male, prior to the um, step up of Title IX regulations, you know, a dean of students would deal with that probably in a manner that would have a negotiated settlement. Um, now those kinds of cases, and this is really happening, I know it's happening, those kind of cases, uh, if any word of gender or sex could be hypothetically applied to the whole context, <coughs> going straight to the Title IX officer, and many of them are going straight to parents. Um, and that pulls away 
um, are kind of the, the way we protect and, and make judgments about our students' conduct away from the faculty and their peer, peers to these panels of experts. And these panels of experts, um, they're making big, I mean, also to be pretty crass about it, they're making enormous money on this. This is big business. Um, they um, are selling um, um, these, these uh, compliance regimes to um, colleges and universities. Um, they're um, employing themselves as investigators. Um, they are um, providing um, legal counsel when the, because all these things are going now you know hitting the federal courts. So um, uh, uh, everything has now been deferred into a legal issue. Um, rather than a broader question of student conduct. So yeah. I, I'm going to break the rule a little bit, and Victoria can chime in. I'm going to make a little bit of a comment and ask her to respond. <laughs> but um, so I think I see a connection to what you're saying with something that um, I've been concerned about in the way we're dealing with Title IX issues here at school. And I'm very interested in this idea of kind of sexualizing Title IX. Because one of the things that I worry about that when we talk about these issues, we put forward, even in like trainings and stuff like that, relatively modest, um, well, not always, but the, it, it's about, um, what, we're, what we're teaching people about is about inappropriate sexual encounters. Whereas my reading of the literature on sexual assault is that it is not about sex. It is really about power. And I worry that when we have all of the conversation about sex and we're not having the conversation about power and other motivations for right. sexual violence, right. that we will fail to recognize important dynamics on our campus because all we're worrying about is some inappropriate thing that one person said to another. I, I do worry a little bit. I, when I, when I, one of the things I like most about what you said is about how that, you know, maybe like with the Amber Alert, we feel really good about the Amber Alert and then it, it allow it distracts from maybe attention and resources from harder things to solve and have conversations about. And I do worry a little bit that when we, not not to diminish the importance of this, it, it, it's, it's the opposite actually, mm -hmm. because a lot of what's motivating actually sexual assault, and this ties in with our presenter from last week, who was looking at rape and civil war, and basically arguing that this is not about genocide or sex or reproduction or anything. What she's finding is that people are engaging in um, multiple perpetrator rape as a bonding mechanism mm -hmm. for um, uh, non-cohesive mm -hmm. rebel organizations. That, that you, you have to be sort of, that we should be having more conversation about the non-sexy things that, are, that underlie um, sexual assault. Um, so I don't know, am I getting you? Yeah, or, no, okay. I totally agree. In fact, my first version of this paper started with thinking about the demographics of um, college students today. Um, women are fastly becoming the majority. Um, women um, will enter the job market in higher numbers. Um, the marriage rate um, among college age students has dramatically, I mean just phenomenally declined. Um, and so no longer um, are students in colleges and universities to find marriage partners. Um, their, um, their women are there so they can excel and um, try to rise up faster in the uh, economic ladder than the generation before them. Um, and so it really is more than what I think we're recognizing, a period of intense competition between women and men on college campuses. So rather than thinking about what are the implications of that for gender equality, and it's kind of mystifying because women are you know, in a better position, but we all know, and I'm sure um, the research last week tends to show, when women actually are in um, improving their position in society, that's when most, most likely there's going to be a reaction to them. And that's you know, across the globe, we can talk about that kind of phenomena. So instead of like, thinking through all of these issues, what's going on on our college campuses, and what does it mean about gender inequality and women asserting a different kind of role in society, 
Um, it's all about acquaintance group. Um, and um, you know, not, I'm not saying that it's not a problem in itself, it's but it really itself. narrows a whole complex range of issues that are important when we talk about women's equality. But, but I don't think in any way one should see the idea that there's a fixed pie of what we can discuss and that issues of power and authority and presence and leadership on campus are being eclipsed because we're talking about rape and sexual assault. Yep. And there's no reason that discussion on rape and sexual assault should mean the other conversation isn't taking place. But it's not taking place. I mean, if but, the but campaign the, but, is... But very fundamentally, the idea that we need to talk less about mm -hmm. rape and sexual assault in order to have a dialogue on about power dynamics yeah. on campus, I think, is a... That's not what I'm saying. It's not about talking less about sexual assault. It's reducing sexual assault into a formula like it's on us which assumes that it's about some kind of social interaction where your bystander is supposed to prevent the act from happening. Um, it's not talking about sexual assault in a college classroom where there's an open discussion of a whole complex history of how it's been defined and um, rape reform, how it succeeded, how it hasn't succeeded. I mean, none of my students know anything about how um, rape is processed in criminal courts. Um, you know, it's, so it, it's, it's, a, I, it's a more complex and nuanced conversation rather than I'm saying, I mean, obviously I'm not saying I talk about sexual assault. I write on it and I teach about it. Um, um, but I'm saying that the sexual assault conversation has limited the way we think about larger issues of inequality on campus. So um, I know that I'll, going back to kind of the talking to men about how of like trying to get them to not perpetrate sexual assault or sexual harassment and other kinds of things like that. I know that at a lot of colleges in the U.S., including here, uh, in like the first week of school, they separate out men and women and they give a talk on like, and I don't I don't know if they still separate it out, but. <laughs> Uh, they where they say like okay they, here's a situation is this rape is this not what is the college policy on that or whatever it is right um, the the issue that I was talking with Danielle about this actually yesterday but um, the issue that I see is that um, a lot of the teaching about a lot of the training programs that exist about understanding what it means to be masculine and how that operates within a power context and how that relates to sexual assault and other kinds of things um, is based on the idea of very, being very introspective and trying to reflect on yourself, which in itself is a stereotypically feminine thing to do. So I wonder um, if you have thought about or if you have any ideas of like how, how do you go about that kind of training or those kinds of things without it being such in such a uh, stereotypically feminized context. Um, I don't know if I see any harm in a stereotyp stereotypical no, feminized context because, because I think, um, I mean, I'm, and what the literature on perpetration seems to suggest is that men often commit rape without a mens rea, without understanding that they're actually committing violence. And so there's a way in which um, anything that produces more perspective taking, I think is gonna have some kind of positive effect. Um, and, um, and also I think that when you're training or speaking to students who are first entering a college campus, people come from so many different life situations. And, you know, some people would never even say the word sex in their household, and some people it, it, it's very open, and some people come from different cultures in which, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of what would be considered inappropriate behavior is different. So in some ways, it is norm setting, um, uh, these kinds of uh, training programs, but I think for me the issue is that they're often packaged. You know, that, that this is the methodology in which 
you're going to kind of learn what the appropriate behaviors are. And I don't think um, maybe it could be a masculine perspective on things, but maybe it could be just different ways of learning or understanding information. Um, I don't think package programs um, that are more behavioral mod in their understanding of how they're going to change um, people um, is are, are what I would do. Um, um, and you know, again, there's a business in that. I mean, I do a lot of work in prisons, um, and there is uh, a lot of effort, especially on women prisoners, to kind of teach them social responsibility. Um, um, and it is this isn't a standard norm. And in this case, they're trying to get them to adopt more feminized norms about how women, you know, act in social settings. Um, and um, so I think it's impossible to have like a prepackaged behavioral program that isn't applying some kind of gender stereotype of some kind or another. Um, I mean, I would be fine with students having more control <laughs> over w what that kind of programming looks like or um, having more varieties of approaches available. The problem with a lot of this legislation is it, it, and it's doing it for a reason, it's doing it because um, the argument is that some settings are, are, are never going to keep up with the, um, the colleges and universities that really have stepped up their awareness. And so we have to kind of create standards or insist on bystander programs or insist on these surveys of this kind or we're not going to get the broad base of institutions. I think you lose a lot when you use that kind of approach. I don't know if I totally answered your question. I kind of <laughs> went around it in all different kinds of ways, but I tried. Yes. I think another big problem with the programming is it's so bystander intervention focused that everyone is kind of taught to identify as a bystander and maybe you're not actually analyzing your own behavior in that context as well. Yeah, that's very interesting. Well, then there's a, there's a, I mean, increasing data coming out that it may, some of those trainings may actually make people believe that it's normative to act Absolutely. in these ways, that it's actually mm -hmm. can be associated with, with increases in just the behavior it's expected to dampen. So oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Thank you so much. Please join me.